what I want to talk about today is some recent work that we've done in epidemiology using search engine logs. Now, um, like every successful field, epidemiology has uh, many fathers, but one of them is John Snow from the middle of the 19th century, and what he was facing was an epidemic of cholera, and after talking to some people, he decided to put them on a map. So this is a map of where he was treating patients, and each dot represents uh, a person who came down with cholera, and what he noticed was that round here, uh, exactly here, this is the Broad Street Pump, is where there's a cluster of people. So uh, thinking about this at, at a higher level, he looked back on all his patients and tried to find the commonality between them. He didn't know anything about bacteria, but the fact that something that this pump was in common to him meant that this was a risk factor, and this is something that he wanted to eliminate in the end, what he did was he convinced the, the uh, municipality to remove the um, head of the pump, and by that, he stopped the cholera epidemic. So it's pretty impressive. Um, what we want to do is ask some modern epidemiology questions, things like, what are the risk factors for uh, influenza? Or uh, is online dating a risk factor for sexually transmitted diseases? Um, something else is something that we've looked in the past is, does the positive portrayal of certain celebrities cause anorexia or is uh, a precursor of anorexia? Some of these things are uh, the more traditional epidemiology questions like um, the influenza question. Some are more complicated because they are concerned with things that happen online. So online dating sites as a risk factor for STDs is, is a question that's really hard to study. Because if you would want to do that in a, a traditional setting, you would have to go and run a survey asking people who have the disease whether they visited these sites. People don't tend to answer these kinds of questions because it's considered to be a sensitive topic. So it's hard to do. Um, I want to claim that we have a data source that's actually very useful for these kinds of questions, and that is internet search engines. Uh, it's worth mentioning the volumes here. 85% of the U.S. population uses the Internet. About 80% of these people, when they have a medical concern, they'll go to the Internet in order to find a solution. And when I say go to the Internet, most of them will use a search engine. Um, last year, this month, last year, in 2000, December 2012, the estimate was uh, that people submitted 17 and a half or so billion queries two search engines in the US. So the data is uh, huge, um, and we know that it represents people's behaviors. We don't know about each person individually, but when you look at things like the number of people who ask about a certain type of cancer versus cancer incidence, there's a very good correlation. You know, when you look at the number of people asking about a certain drug, there's a very good correlation to the sales of that drug in the US. So we know that these queries represent real people's activity both in the virtual world and in the uh, physical one. So here's what we want to do. Um, we're looking at a three-stage process where first, given some medical condition that we're interested in, we'll identify a cohort of people who are probably suffering from that condition, and we'll synchronize them, meaning we will say what is the first time that they um, thought or realized that they had this condition, then we'll take all the activities of these people, all their queries, go back and try to generalize them. So we're not interested in a specific dating site. We want to say when this, when this query was issued, it actually represented something about all dating sites online. And finally, once we have this cohort and these annotated queries, we, we will look back at the activities of these people and try to find commonality. What did these people do? shortly before they developed the condition. Now I'm going to talk both about the methods and the results of these three stages. And when I do that, I'll talk about uh, data that we collected from Bing searches in the US over a six months period. What we have is the query text. That's usually three words, give or take. Um, we have the time that the query was issued, um, an anonymized identifier of the user, meaning I can say that two searches were made by the same person, but I don't know who that person is. And we also know which pages they clicked on. So from the pages that you're presented, which ones did you actually click on? 
Um, and we also use DBpedia, which is a derivative of Wikipedia, in order to do the categorization over here, which I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so for the first stage, we want to identify a group of people who are suffering from some medical condition that we're interested in. And for a long time, this really baffled us. We can't go to the people and ask them, you know, are you suffering from this medical condition? So how do we know that they are? Um, but then we realized that some people um, actually say so. So they will query, and the query may start with something like, I was diagnosed with HIV. So we know that they have the condition. Um, so given this population, and we can look at the profile of all the medical conditions, drugs, and symptoms that they asked about. We have a list of about 5,000 drugs, 5,000 diseases, and about 2,000 um, symptoms that we can look for uh, with uh, synonyms. And so we can pr construct a predictor to say, given this profile of diseases, drugs, and symptoms that the person asked about, what is the self-identified condition that they're suffering from? Um, we're, we have about 19,000 people in our data set for this. And the results are here. This is the accuracy. This is a multi-class classifier. And you can see that there's like a bimodal distribution here. We're either doing very well if we're using the, the disease profile or we're, using, or we're doing really badly. So it turns out we only need to see what are the diseases that a person asks about in order to identify their disease. But that's not really interesting, right? They're already telling us what they have. So why are we looking at this? And the reason that we are is that we actually want to ask a slightly different question, which is, if we look at the disease that a person asks most often about, is that the one that they're suffering from? So we're, we're building a set of attributes here, starting from that self-identified population, and then we can relax our classifier. So if we just take these attributes, build a classifier, um, and look at the self-identified population, we will um, then correlate that with known incidence of these conditions um, as collected by the NIH and the CDC. So just looking at the self-identified population, we get to a correlation of about 0.4. This is the zero over here, okay? And now we're starting to use our classifier. We're looking at larger and larger populations, meaning we're saying, well, we're not sure about this person, but we are, to a certain degree, we think to a certain degree that they have this condition. And, and every time we count the number of people who have that condition and measure the correlation against um, known incidents, and you see that around here, this threshold of classifier will get to about the same performance. So we can enlarge the population that we're looking at around tenfold um, by using a threshold of the classifier here. So we have 10 times the number of people that we can look at, and the correlation is still pretty good. So we're, we think that we have a high precision set of people who have the condition, and the way that we say, we synchronize them is that we say, we'll, we'll take the first time that they asked about this condition and say that this is when they realize that they have it. Good. Now, the next stage is to annotate the queries. Um, as I said, what we want to do in this stage is to say, when somebody asks about a dating site, they ju don't just mean this specific dating site, they might mean dating sites in general. So we start with uh, user queries, and we look for all the cases where that query resulted in the user clicking on a Wikipedia page. And enough, if enough people did that, we will say that there is a mapping from the query text to that specific Wikipedia page. And then each Wikipedia page has a set of um, categories for it, so we'll annotate it with those categories. So just a simple example, if we look at uh, the query ACM, that will be annotated with uh, these categories some of them are very specific, such as the Association of Computing Machinery, but some are very general, such as uh, learned societies. Okay, so, so now each query is represented by the text of that query itself, but also by these general categories. And now we get to the final stage, which is say, trying to say, okay, so we've got our users, we've got our queries, how do we actually map these, uh, the things that we did, they did before to um, their disease. So there are two ways to do that. One is to say, let's compare that population of people with the con medical condition to everybody else. 
Um, that's difficult because really what we want to do is to compare them to a similar population, right? If we're looking at, say, pregnancy, it doesn't make sense to compare it to the entire population because half of that population is irrelevant for it. So instead, we're using uh, a technique from epidemiology called the self-controlled case series. Um, skip that. So think of, uh, graphically think of it this way. So we have our time axis. And supposing we have a user who was exposed at a given time to something. That could be that originally it was when they received a vaccine. We will say when they made a query about something, that is the date of exposure to that, that something. That opens a window of an incubation period. So we expect that within this window, something may happen. And if, if that something is that they developed a medical condition, so they, if this is a vaccine, maybe they develop some uh, fever over here, then we are more likely to say that this exposure leads to this high fever, whereas if the high fever was developed, say, here, we'll say, you know, it's probably irrelevant. Um, so if that's the case, then um, turning to three equations, um, we're modeling this as a, a non-homogeneous Poisson process. We're modeling each user. And essentially what we're saying is that there is some base rate of infection, some base rate of developing that medical condition over time, but we're modeling it with the exposure. And we're doing this for each patient. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, what happened when this person queried about this specific topic to develop, um, maybe develop that condition versus everything they did before and after? And for our population of users, we're maximizing the log likelihood of uh, the risk of that exposure. Okay, so some results. We've looked at a, a number of uh, medical conditions, but I'll show you a few here. Um, you can see that the number of users is big, but it's not huge by any means. We're using, a, as I said, a high accuracy classifier. We're not trying to find every, each and every individual who has undergone an abortion in the US. Um, each of these people make a significant number of queries and a good number of categories. So the categories are for us what could be the precursor condition. Each of these are, is tested against the medical condition. And these are the results. Um, I will say that this is cherry picked. So I've, re I've removed um, one kind of a precursor condition. So we're, right, we're uh, trying to identify what happens before the medical condition happens. And there could be two kinds of things that happen. For example, if somebody uh, queries for methods of abortion just before they have an abortion, well, that's not a risk factor. Just, that's just something they do before they undergo an abortion. So that's a precursor, but not a risk factor. But let's look at allergies here. So these are the top three risk factors. These are actually all the statistically significant uh, precursor conditions that we found, and they all seem to be risk factors. So um, these two are, uh, one is a qu uh, query for a pet store. The other is just the general category of pet stores. And you can see that they have a um, relative hazard, which is quite big. And, and it's well known that having pets in the house is a risk factor for allergy. And this is uh, maybe a foodborne allergy down here. Um, there are some interest, more interesting things here. So for example, for eating disorders, this you can read, uh, for example, anorexia. Image search is uh, a precursor condition. And this is well known. People with anorexia tend to start their uh, disease by looking at these images. Um, let's look at STDs, so um, herpes over here. And two of the queries, one relates to a porn site, one relates to a dating site. So going back to our question from before, um, we actually show that this is true. Um, dating sites are a risk factor for certain STDs. For HIV, again, a porn site, um, and online dating sites, um, homosexual online dating sites in this case. Um, some of those, it's hard for us to explain. So why do heart attacks, um, why are they correlated with somebody visiting a, a fast food joint just before? We're not sure, but this is something that may be worth investigating by doing a clinical trial. So to summarize, um, we're interested in, in risk factors, but we can actually only find precursors of medical conditions. We're using 
these anonymized search logs to look for them, the advantage being that we have a huge population that we can look at, and we can look at a large set of uh, medical conditions and precursor behaviors, and um, almost without any additional cost. Um, and as a, an added benefit, um, we can identify a population with a specific medical condition, and that might be useful for some other research as well. And with that, I will close. Thank you.